So yeah, this is, uh, I have to say, this is one of the more, I've never really done a presentation like this before, uh, particularly at a tech conference. Uh, so usually I would just throw up slides and kind of wing it, but I prepared a, a little talk for you. And then I've got three, um, three kind of slideshows that I put to music afterwards, um, and I'll talk about those. Um, but let's, uh, let's get started. So, UX as I understand it, is the point of interaction between man and machine, and how to interpret that with visual accuracy to successfully convey the information at hand. This is what we do whenever we take a photograph. Some, of course, are more successful at it than others. It's become easy to convey high quality images for virtually anyone now. An iPhone is miles ahead of our parents in somatic 110s. But what does it take to move beyond the merely representational snapshots of our lives, our needs, and to take images that convey emotion, a story, humanity, passion, and art, all wrapped up into one neat, tidy frame? That's what I attempt to do every time I press the shutter. Of course, there's the machine, the technical process, that comes between our sight imagination and reflexes. It's mastering this cumbersome tool and putting the appropriate one to the appropriate use, or not, as I sometimes prefer to do, at the decisive time, and then doing it again and again. It's that honing of craft and innate visual skills that sets photographers apart, and their ability to craft timeless imagery. Of course, there's all different kinds of photography that require all different kinds of needs and tastes, but um, let's talk about what I feel is, is photography. I've done it all probably at least once, including photographing mold slimes in a laboratory for a two week <coughs> stint filling in for a friend of mine. But long ago, I discovered that it's the photographers who take their time, stick it out, go back again and again to a subject, and keep whittling it down, and ultimately make the best work. You need to stay consistent, and think of it as a project, to create a visual style that you can call your own. It's almost like branding, if one could brand their eyes, brain, finger, and camera connection. I'm constantly composing, putting the world into frame, camera or no camera. And when I do have a camera, when I'm working, and I see all the elements needed to come into play, my brain buzzes in a certain way, and it's like I get a small squirt of some nice kind of drug. My chest tickles and even editing afterwards too, especially if it's something I wasn't quite sure I had in the first place, or an image that reveals itself that I'd forgotten I'd taken. I get the same kick when I see photos that move me made by others. It sets that Kimberlini-like alarm bell off. It's like a shot to the head and the heart. And to do that continually over a span of a career is the challenge for any artist. For me, it's been equal parts exhaustion and exhilaration. So, a little about me. I grew up in the suburbs of Seattle to the north um, <clears throat> in a place called Bothell. I first got into photography watching my uncle in his dark room, set up in my grandmother's laundry closet. I lived with my grandparents a great deal of my mid-childhood due to divorced parents. It was in the 70s. I was hooked from that point on with photography and did paper, yearbook, etc. Worked in labs, it's all I've ever known, which is sometimes a chilling thought. I didn't have a particularly tidy life growing up, though nothing memoir worthy, and so I turned to music out of boredom, curiosity, and testosterone. It was my salvation in the suburbs. First it was heavy metal and classic rock, again we're talking the 70s here, and then punk and new wave starting about 1980, and then of course there was grunge. I got good grades, graduated early, but my biggest interest was always photography. Aside from the sex pistols and pissing off my single mom, who bless her heart, gave me more freedom and means than most kids. Then it was off to college, where I met up with future famous musicians, label heads, producers, artists, at the UW campus, and at parties, clubs, and record stores, and we set out to make a scene, and that we did. I'm now older, with two young children, and only begrudgingly shoot music at times, if I'm getting paid or it's something extravagant my old pals are up to. 
I've put out several books of my work on grunge and breakdancing. These uh, Touch Me I'm Sick and Cypher here. Got time to check out after. <clears throat> and I have a cottage industry in licensing and print sales of my grunge work, or mostly. I've done editorial, travel, commercial, commissioned and self-financed projects, but not as many as I'd have liked to. I'm going to get a little, uh, little personal and inspirational here, but I'll keep it, keep it real. Um, you see, I've suffered from chronic pain my whole life. It started as headaches when I was about three, and it spread from there. 25 years as a drunk rock photographer living off pizza and dark fumes didn't help any. The thought of pain was behind every other thought or action every second of the day. It's taken much time and expense, but I'm doing better now. In the end, all we truly own is our bodies, so we have to have those in order to do our best. I do feel that it has held me back in my career in life, but I've also learned a lot from it about perseverance and the spirit. My memory is shot and I have ADD, but that's probably why I photograph. Less than a year ago, I could barely get up and down the hills of my neighborhood without wincing in agony. Now I'm downhill skiing after a 25-year absence and writing this speech. It's taken away a lot of slope time, let me tell you. Now to spin this back to photography. I've worked up a little theory of what comprises a photograph and how that relates to the heart, mind, and soul, elements one must also consider hugely in any healing process or trauma, in all of life, period, for that matter. I see a photograph as consisting of three elements, the moment, light, and composition. We often talk about the moment. Oh, darling, here's my phone. Let's capture the moment. But what is moment? Moment is a precise spot in time measured in fractions of a second. It's available to all and seen by few. The moment is also a collision, a collapse of these subjects moving through time into the unwavering frame of the camera and lens as executed by the photographer. It's the photographer's decision only of which precise moment to trip the shutter and why that moment might be important or right or not even knowing but just instinctually feeling it. It's a primal reflex coupled with the need to make something complete, emotionally appealing, interesting, or at least damn well exciting. Um, out of a usually complex moment in time, sometimes and often even in complete stillness. This is the part that's the, of the mind. It's the storyteller, the conjurer of meaning, the explainer of coincidence. It's both intellectual grasping and imagination at the same time, almost like nonfiction fantasy. Its importance and appeal is in the greater universal narrative of life we all share. The moment is the human experience, albeit, as we will see, it is only superficial if we don't couple it with the other two elements. To do that, we rely on light and color, and I consider black and white to be a color as well. We're talking tones. Whenever I have a moment of deja vu, a glimpse beyond into the past, it's most often triggered by light. Light conjures up emotions. It stirs the heart. Light is vibrating all around us. It can be brilliant or subdued or harsh or dim. Or you could say it was ebullient, melancholy, aggressive, and depressing. With color or tone, we can say the same thing and strive to combine just the perfect amounts of both. Of course, without a strong connection of subject and timing, it won't have quite the same resonance. My favorite piece of advice is from the photographer Larry Clark of Tulsa and Kids fame. He once said that his teacher told him to always shoot into the light. In other words, use the light as you're not supposed to. Break the rules. Look at it in a way that might be considered incorrect and things start to get interesting. Use flash when you wouldn't expect it or keep the color balance uncorrected. Use light to your advantage to man man manipulate the scene either keeping it to its original feeling when there, or adding or subtracting to bring across your own subjective new interpretation. Composition is the last, and in my estimation, the most important, for, most important part of the photograph. It is the grounding, the gut, the foundation it's built on. It could, could be called the soul if we separated soul and spirit, assigning spirit upward to the heart, 
and the sole to the, to the, to the, to the middle. And as we've come to learn, it's the gut that's the key to good health. It supplies the other organs with nutrients. It's the mother, so to speak, the Gaia. And it's the gut that keeps its cool under pressure, manifesting itself as expertly realized compositions. So even if you have the two of the above, moment and light, if there isn't a solid foundation of composition, it all falls flat on its face. Composing is the unshakable act of the photographer. The ability to take these pre-existing conditions, moment, light, and color, and frame them cohesively and precisely while figuring in many other factors going on simultaneously. So even though the photographer has made the correct decision at the right time and has the correct light and exposure, if he or she doesn't place it in the frame dynamically, I hesitate to say correctly or perfectly as I believe in neither of those concepts, then it's ostensibly a lost moment, just a moment hanging there, shorn of bigger emotion uh, and meaning not a truly charged and fully realized photograph. Now regarding negative space, what most of us call negative space, a term I never thought correct as it always seemed most positive to me, I think of it as emotional space. It is the surrounding ether used as an aesthetic choice and design element to corral the living world into meaning, predicated by the fact that everything is comprised of spaces. And within those spaces, there are lines and contours and other shapes. The photographer's job is to make sense of it all with that objective tool, the camera. Space sets the scene. Even the lack of space is important in possibly creating a sense of claustrophobia or chaos. You can't make a photograph without involving spaces. I like what Larry Fink has to say about the meaning of space. And because he's a much better photographer than myself and a very erudite professor at Bard, I'll read a page to you from his Aperture Workshop book on composition and op improvisation. And this is a must-have book. He's an absolutely fantastic photographer and probably my biggest influence. There's a difference between atmosphere and space within a picture. Atmosphere is charged space. It fills the setting with feeling and could come away and could come from the way you feel about the place, something from within your mind or from physical conditions. Either way, it is worth trying to emphasize the factors in the reality that create atmosphere, dust or wind or rain, or overriding, overwhelming, oversaturating sun and heat. Can you photograph heat in a way that conveys its hotness? Can you photograph water and make wa the picture feel wet rather than just look like a picture of water? It's all about intensification. <clears throat> and he goes on to talk about the actual act of composing. I usually have an idea of what the composition is going to look like before I press the shutter. The camera can see faster than the eye, so sometimes I'm surprised. But I'm watching the compositions take shape, and I'm lingering in the scene with the camera ready with my finger half cocked, I take on a condition that I call lunge accuracy because the camera is the willful servant of, of your lunging impulse. This isn't necessarily always a physical lunging, but more of a psychotro psychotropic lunge. That experience is similar to mine. We've both worked with some of the same cameras which rely on rangefinder focusing and composing. A rangefinder is an optical hole that one looks through and has a rangefinder patch in the middle that you line up in order to focus a vertical line, image. This is where you can see two lines match up when focusing. You also see white lines superimposed where the composition is estimated to be for the lens chosen, but it's rarely accurate. And the optical window, it really is a window, makes just everything seem in focus in the frame, which of course is not true depending on the lens used. So one needs to be in tune with how the camera works, and even without looking through it, especially without looking through it, which is very important. With the camera away from the eye, it's easier to take in and anticipate a scene, particularly a fast-moving one, and discover new perspectives. I trust the camera to do what it needs to do, as I've already said it myself, and I can guess distances and angles. Somehow the looseness of the rangefinder allows me more of this freedom, if you know that what you're looking at isn't going to be a perfect representation anyway, then why not just push it a bit further? 
Of course, this is accomplished with any camera. It's really a matter of letting go and learning. Now with digital, one has instant replay, so the learning curve has gone down and one can quickly correct your mistakes. But it can be too constricting if one relies on that confirmation too much. You can get hung up, too hung up in technical minute and fret over whether you're making the perfect photo, as I've said, no such thing, and miss the involvement needed with the subject and moment at hand. It's almost as if as, as if we are given as, as if as we are given more confirmation in this digital age, we come to trust ourselves less. There was a lot of trust involved with shooting film. Sometimes one didn't see the images for days or even weeks. Though of course there was nothing worse than coming back from the lab with an armful of over or underexposed film. I don't really miss those days. Chance is everything. Don't get too caught up in expectations. One needs to evolve and use chance to their best advantage. Looseness can be, is, a virtue. As I've said, as I just said, don't get too wrapped in always trying to make that perfect image. I've fallen into that trap many times, and often the best work comes when you begin to forget about yourself, let your ego go, and instead come to a place where you are there to do your best and just get into the zone, so to speak. Do your shamanic twist using a camera instead of drums. The best work often comes when you least expect it. It's the photographer's job to show up and be aware and look and listen closely enough to allow the universe to deliver. So stir the ashes, relax, just push the trigger. Don't get too hung up whether the focus is on or the exposure was right. Use chance. Just be sure you come with the skills to fit what may, to fit it within a framework a way of seeing that you've already established. As Larry Fink puts it, photography is an improvisation, one that's coming off of the tune of life. That tune is always there, everywhere, humming along, and it's up to you to do something different with it, play off of it, push the composition to new forms, like Dylan in 65, Miles in 67, or Nirvana in 91. There are 256,000 pictures uploaded a minute to the internet, and most of it is perfectly satisfied to be nothing more than, than subjects in a box, a base transfer of information. So how do we beat back against that tide in order to keep a modicum of visual literacy and humanity to our culture? Well, one way, to paraphrase the great William Eggleston, is to be at war with the obvious, see through to what is and what is important, and not just what one is told. So, with all that in mind, um, I want to show you three different pieces I put together with musical soundtracks. Um, the first is what I call my vision portfolio. It's, it's similar to what is in the lobby. Uh, it pulls together some of the unifying aspects that I've been trying to accomplish and have talked about here with my photography and shows the way my eye works across different platforms, genres, and times. Um, I probably could have taken it a bit further, but I was pressed for time doing this, and I just decided to actually output it randomly in Lightroom, put it in the slideshow module, and just click random. And some of the combinations that actually came up, I would never have been able to think of myself. I would have been too close to the work. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. I think that's a, a, something that's really important, is that if your work is going to hold together, it should hold together in a random way. It's almost like the old turning a drawing upside down. You know, if the composition works upside down, you're, you're good to go. A um, few of the images are repeated in uh, some of the following essays. So let me, let me get that up here. And uh, I thought it'd be nice for you guys to have a little music here on this. broken down
let your sister down. Yeah. Just bring it. So 
Well, that was, uh, I don't know, about 35 years worth of different ex explorations on my part there. So you can kind of start to see how various themes come together. And I swear Lightroom must have some sort of algorithm that like, if there's a picture of somebody putting his fist in the air, we'll follow it up with another picture of people with fists in the air. Because things like that I would never, I wouldn't, might not have come up with on my own. Or it might have just taken me days and days. And, and, and I just find that fascinating that if you are consistent, are consistent enough with, with your themes and your compositions that you can kind of get away with something like that. So the, the, the next thing I'd like to show you, and um, somehow my notes for it didn't get stapled onto these notes, so I'll just wing it here. But over the, the last uh, seven years, I've been photographing my children. I have a three and a seven-year-old. And it's, uh, I've taken something like 65,000 pictures in that time. And it's been a real minefield to sort of whittle it down so that it's interesting to other people than not just myself, because children photography is a, is a uh, minefield of cliches, let me tell you. So, and, and just because my kids are cute and I'm handy with a camera and you know, what, what makes that important. So I tried to find a, a more universal theme within that, and that is, um, that is uh, play. I, I, I discovered that all, what all kids like to do most is play. So I, I put together this essay called Child's Play. And I've also kept my children um, anonymous in it so that I think it has more of a universal appeal. It's not about their personality. It's more about their char like a, a, a archetypal uh, character of children. Um, so let's take a look at that. This time I'll get you, we'll go to the full screen. There we go. Okay.
So that is very on, ongoing. In fact, I just added different, Im took some out and added different images to it just a couple days ago. Um, I try and keep it at a certain, certain length and just, you know, I, I, at first I photographed my son almost like to keep him alive. It was like the clicks of the shutter. And then I realized, well, one-year-olds aren't that interesting. And it's, it keeps just getting interesting as they get older. Um, so I want to get one more in here if you're, if you're not bored yet, if you'd like to see one more. Um, and this is some very recent work. Um, I spent the last, uh, from September to January, documenting the Fry Art Museum on First Hill here. They did an exhibit of Stranger Geniuses. And the Stranger is a local newspaper, and every year they give away um, $5,000 in six different categories to local artists. And so they, uh, the Fry celebrated by commissioning um, not only pieces uh, uh, for the, inside the museum, but also uh, panels and workshops and performances, and you name it. And so they had me document it all for a, a hopefully a, a hardcover catalog book that will come out. So this, uh, I put a little piece together to um, a Shabazz Palace's song. Shabazz Palace is figured uh, highly in the, in the show, um, their collect, the Black Collective. Uh, and it's, this is an exercise in endurance because there's about 144 pictures, I think. And they're roughly in chronological order as I, as I shot them. But it'll, start to, it'll be a little fast at first, but I think that you'll find that you'll kind of get into the groove. And again, um, it's uh, that exercise in, in consistency.
questions? I've, I've probably used a tripod once in the last 10 years. Yeah, and in fact, uh, like I said in my talk, a lot of those pictures, even the ones that you think like, oh, this all aligns is so, I'm not looking through the viewfinder. So, you know, I'm often, I'm often like this or, you know, just, just away from my eye. <laughs> but I've worked with this particular camera so much over the years that it just becomes second nature to me. Yeah. set that up, um, let's say that this was, the, this was the side of the roof here, the drop, and there was kind of a little railing thing here. He was, he was right, he was right there, and I was kind of looking over this way, and I just out of the corner of my eye, I saw Mike, and you know, I've photographed him a lot through the years, but I saw him just kind of, kind of, I can't see his dark but and so, and so I just,
usually comes down more in the editing process? Do you know the... It's as I'm taking As I'm taking it. Or is, that just, is it not that point as far as like how, how you do it? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I usually, um, unless, unless I have a directive, I'm working on, on commission or assignment, and I have a directive from the art director, like, oh, I need lots of space or put type here or there or whatever. I don't really consider the audience, per se, the, the viewer, while I'm taking the photo. Is that what you mean? Yeah, or considering the fact, so in music, David Byrne often talks about the context in which he uses mm -hmm. the or is it a very different feeling or way that you would write for an orchestra or a large opera house versus that you're currently hanging out with him? So I'm just wondering if there's a different point where you consider that sort of intimacy with David or the way that you edit it. Um, well, I mean, there's certain sensitivities while taking it, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I feel more comfortable in using a, using a flat for my money than I would for, you know, um, some, some um, taking a jazz concert. So there, there are those just, just physical things to consider. But um, no, not usually. I just usually do my own thing and then sort it out after the fact. Usually it's editing. When it comes down to editing, and editing I can't stress enough, that's, it's nothing worse than having somebody say, check out my photos after I show you several hundred pictures, but say, <laughs> saying, check out my photos, and they send you a link of like, you know, a hundred images of their friend's band or whatever. It's like, you could have sent one or two, and the guy would have, would have been much more powerful and to the point, and so editing is, is, is key, I think, and that's what I stress a lot with my photographers. And when I look at their work, I always try and find that images that, and it's quite often the image that they are ready to throw away, or they just, eh, they don't like it so much, and, and it's like, to me as the viewer, I'm like, okay, this is where the story starts to tell, because within a single frame, you really want to try and tell the story um, with all the elements that, that, are, that are at your disposal. You know, that's what makes an iconic image, is, 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 is the complete story within that frame. And it can just be a picture of light coming It doesn't need words, you know. That's kind of why with this talk today, I got away from the like, well, I did this with this photo and I did that with that photo. I mean, I wanted to just sort of be more about the viewer. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, I mean, today, I think it's just more about the viewer. It's easier to meet the viewer through the editing that it is to actually see the audience. It's about the fact. Oh, um, it depends upon, um, you know, I mean, obviously if you're shooting for the press, for AP, they're, they're editing pictures, you get a big one. Uh, for the most part, uh, I think it's a great tool. I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think, again, it's about consistency, you know. When I look at a person's work and it's like, it's got these squares and weird rectangles and black and white here and color there and it's just, you know, they, they did some heavy processing on one but not another and it just, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hold together uh, as, a, as a visual style or, you know, I don't see them in it at all or anything. So you need to keep that consistency. You know, with my, my images, I usually, I do some cropping, but it's usually no more than 10 or 15 percent. Um, and yeah, just some basic what I would have done with a darkroom scissors. But there are, you know, uh, there are things that, uh, like with the break dancing images, where um, you know those were, were done on film, but then later scanned. And I would take away elements maybe that were distracting in the background. And I've always done a little bit of that, but not to the point where it's like. really more just like what you would have